Okay, all right. Hey, hello. Buenas tardes, everybody. It's me, Professor here. And first off, let me uh, try to get the uh, lighting uh, uh, lighting uh, just right here, so you, so there's not much of, of a glare while I'm recording this uh, this video for you guys. <clears throat> all right, uh, hang on. Maybe if I close the blinds a, a little bit here. Okay, all right. I, I think that's a little bit better. All right. Uh, well, listen. I hope everybody had a great uh, spring vacation and. Uh, Hard to believe now we're already in the second half of, of the semester. And it's been a while since I've done a video for you guys, so it's definitely a good time for me to uh, come back and say hello to, to everybody. And uh, in this video, I want to go ahead and talk about the uh, second half of the Ken Burns and Jazz series and focus in on episodes 6 through 10. And actually, let me, uh, let me correct myself a, a little bit here. I'm going to hold off on talking about episode 10 when I give my final uh, video about the uh, Jazz series toward the end of April, beginning of, of May, in which basically I... I wrap up, I give my uh, final thoughts, my observations about the uh, the entire series, what it means to the class, uh, all of that, uh, all of that jazz, so, so, so to speak. Uh, <clears throat> so I think uh, in this one, I'll, in this video, I'll go ahead and focus in uh, exclusively <clears throat> on. Uh, <clears throat> okay, there we go. I think I finally got the lighting situation fixed up. I'll focus in exclusively on episodes six through six through nine, and in terms of the time frame that these episodes that take us. Uh, these episodes take us roughly from about the uh, tail end of the 1930s when Franklin Roosevelt is about to run for his uh, third term as president uh, all the way into the early 1960s when John F. Kennedy comes into, uh, comes into the presidency, basically ushering this uh, new era, this new frontier type of, uh, type of belief. So even though we're talking about a span of roughly a little over 20 years in terms of the changes that happened to the United States in, in that time, the changes were, act, were absolutely uh, uh, momentous, uh, gigantic, astronomical, humongous, uh, all of those a a adjectives. Um, and of course, and of course, I was reflected in the way the, the music uh, of, of jazz uh, was, uh, was, was, was changing from the time where we left off with, with episode five. And of course, the early origins, the early days of uh, the rise of swing with guys like Benny Goodman, Art, Artie Shaw, uh, Glenn, Glenn Miller, and of course, the Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington had already uh, uh, it had already been on the scene for uh, for a little over a decade at, at that at that point in time in, in terms of establishing the, the, themselves. Uh, that is uh, not just as great African American artists, but as great artists. Period. <clears throat> but the time from uh, from that uh, from that period uh, with uh, with uh, Duke and, and Satchmo, Miller, uh, Goodman, uh, Shaw, uh, and, and all, all of the, all of those guys to the times of the early 1960s, late 50s. Definitely a lot of a lot of changes, and that's what I'll, what I'll focus in on in this uh, in this video here. So uh, let me go ahead and start off right now and talk a little bit about what's happening in episode six. That's the episode that you're looking at this week. That's the episode uh, uh, episode uh, known known as Swing, uh, the Velocity of Celebration. And basically, this is the episode that corresponds with the tail end of the Great Depression, just before the United States is about to get uh, get involved in World War II. Uh, Europe, of course, had been in a lot of, a lot of turmoil since the uh, early 1930s. Of course, Hitler had been in power since the early 1930s. <clears throat> the European economies and political systems had still been in a lot of a disarray since the end of World War I, and the events of the 1930s didn't really help much, especially with uh, Mr. Hitler, uh, for lack of a term, causing his uh, mischief and mayhem. <clears throat> So uh, some of the people that we're looking at in, in episode six, uh, among the people that we, that we meet, we're talking about the, talking about the great saxophone players like uh, Coleman Hawk Hawkins and, and, and Le Le Lester Young. One of the points that seems to be made in the episode is this idea that the saxophone is like an expression of the, of the, of, of the, of the, the male voice. Uh, some of the artists uh, really uh, uh, had, had more of a uh, potent, a virile type, type of sound. And, and people like 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 Hawkins really really uh, really fit that mold. And then you had people like 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 uh, Lester Young, who was nicknamed the the Prez. Billy Holiday was the one who gave him gave him that that nickname. And uh, Lester Young seemed to symbolize this. Uh, uh, I guess you might say that the new African American ma ma male, uh, kind of like the uh, along the lines of the uh, uh, some of the uh, themes that the uh, Harlem Renaissance people like uh, like uh, like. like uh, Langston Hughes and many others have talked about back in the 1920s. Lester Young seemed to epitomize that, and of course his fashion statements with his famous uh, pork pie hats, uh, that definitely fit, fit, uh, fit into, into this too. 
Uh, but along with some of these others, of course, we see the rise of people like people like like Count Basie, who came out of who was born in New Jersey, but came but came direct but came out out of Kansas. He came out of the the, the wild and raucous Kansas City scene. For all intents and purposes, it seems like Kansas City was lo was lo like like the wild west in many respects uh, back in the uh, uh, back in the 1930s, before Las Vegas became really popular, starting in the 1950s after World War II. You might say Kansas City had that wild and reckless type of nature that was reflected in the music, and Count Basie seemed to epitomize that um, since he played a lot of the Kansas City clubs in the mid 1930s. <clears throat> Okay, other people that we meet in the episode, uh, uh, we, we meet uh, we meet Billy Holiday. Billy Holiday has really started to come into her, in, into her own as a, uh, as a as a as a wonderful uh, female vo vo vocalist, Billy Holiday and Ella Fitzgerald, who's mentioned in the episode too, and then uh, uh, and then people like and, and then people like like Benny Goodman continue to promote this notion of swing. But the thing with Goodman is that uh, there are a lot of changes in terms of, of his lineup. People coming in in and, uh, in and out of his lineup. Uh, but for sure, by the end of the nineteen thirties, people like like Gene Krupa and also Charlie Christian. Uh, Goodman was excellent in terms of giving people people uh, a young talent a new vehicle in which to express themselves. And uh, even though uh, Goodman had a British for being a really bit of a taskmaster, he also talks about how he had this really uh, a mean mean gaze called the the, the 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 ray. If you got the ray from Goodman, you did something wrong. And some of the uh, and some of the musicians uh, uh, interviewed for the story talk about the infamous ray that Goodman would, uh, would, would, would give. So even though he was a bit of a rough taskmaster, when it comes to bringing out new talent, Goodman was good at that, and Charlie Christ Christian definitely symbolized that. In terms of new talent, Ella Fitzgerald is one who comes out onto the scene in the 1930s as being a vocalist for, uh, for, for Chick Webb, before Chick Webb passes away due to the complications from his various uh, physical illnesses, which has suddenly hit his, his growth and really made life difficult for, for him up until his death in the, uh, up until his death in the 1939. <clears throat> okay, um, the, uh, the last thing I want to say about the episode, uh, about episode six is uh, we, get, we get the rise of the first uh, jazz, uh, uh, jazz events. Uh, right now, anybody who knows, about, who knows about jazz in terms of festivals, Newport and Montreux in Switzerland really, come, really start to come to mind, but it was Randall's Island in, in New York which really got a lot of people uh, uh, interested, got, got uh, uh, you might say, this first festival atmosphere. So I guess long before the days of, uh, <clears throat> of things like, like Woodstock in the 1960s, and then there was the, uh, the US Festival in the, in, the, in the early 1980s, uh, Steve Wozniak from, from Apple was, was the one who helped to uh, organize that. A lot of the uh, heavy metal bands played at that time. In fact, that's where Motley Crue uh, uh, first came on the scene in the 1983 US Festival. But long before all of those festivals, Jazz was the first, seemingly the first music uh, genre which started this notion of festivals, and the Randall's Island one was, you might say, the precursor for later events, such as the famous Newport one, which came on the scene in the 1950s. I'll talk a little bit more about Newport in just a few minutes here. So those were the, a lot of the uh, key events and, and, and themes happening in episode six, and, and essentially jazz it seemed to continue this idea of trying to promote this uh, free spirit, uh, you know, don't uh, don't worry too much about your problems, or here is the music to help you forget about your problems. Because the Great Depression was still it was still gripping the nation by the end of the 1930s, despite the best efforts of FDR and the New Deal uh, policies. Okay, uh, part seven is called "Dedicated to Chaos," and this is the episode which takes us into the World War World War II, II period. And among the people that that we meet early on. Uh, we look at people like Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie. So even though jazz, you might say, had this uh, the swinging, dancing, everybody having a, having a great time type of type of a sensibility, and I think the Kansas City sound seemed to contribute to that. There was a sense that some, some artists wanted to experiment, and you might say, test the boundaries, get away from uh, uh, get away from the you might say the formulaic or the uh, um, how can I put this uh, stale sound that maybe jazz was developing, especially the, the swing sound. By the end of the 1930s, so definitely people like uh, like Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie, uh, who make their first essentially the first appearances in the series, uh, they are among the the early ones to uh, to in essence uh, you know, take jazz into a little bit of a of a different direction. <clears throat> okay, uh, let me flip flip my uh, flip my, flip my, my notes here. Of course, uh, jazz will continue its notion of being, you might say, a uh, uh, a freewheeling music, uh, but with more, shall we say, political overtones, because of course in 1941, 
Guess what happens at the end of the year? Pearl Harbor. So you might say jazz really took on this uh, uh, patriotic sensibility that is, it was a music that epitomized uh, liberty, freedom, democracy, things of this nature. So of course, all the big band guys uh, of the era, like 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 like, like Goodman, especially, especially Glenn Miller, uh, who unfortunately passed away during the war, uh, uh, this his plane this his plane vanished flying over the English Channel uh, in in around 19 uh, in in the 19 in the, in the early early 1940s, but nonetheless, uh, all the artists at the time you might say really started to started to uh, uh, promote jazz as, as this uh, this beacon for liberty, for democracy, for freedom, and of course jazz uh, really had a popularity. Of course, in in, in Europe, the Nazis hated jazz. Uh, the, the Nazis even tried to, as we see in the episode, tried to uh, make their own jazz songs, but with a lot of uh, anti-Semitic reference, references. Uh, uh, there was a Monty Python episode in the, in the 1970s, which essentially tried to play upon this, in, in which uh, the Nazis were trying to make the, uh, uh, were trying to, uh, 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 were trying to make make uh, make make a joke. Uh, that would uh, that would make the allies laugh so much that that that, that, that essentially people would, would would die. See, the the gist of the episode was, was that uh, the allies had the deadliest joke in the world. So if you go in into uh, into Nazi Nazi occupied territory, you tell the joke in German. The officers, the the German soldiers would, would laugh. They bust uh, so hard that 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 uh, that that, that, uh, that they, they would die. My feeling is that Monty Python episode. Took the uh, took the idea of jazz being this uh, this, this weapon, this cultural weapon, uh, but but uh, but made jokes, made made comedy the the essence of the joke. But again, my, my point is here's a prime example of where jazz was you might say a, a military a political weapon during the war. The Nazis tried to counteract that, but I would say with really uh, abysmal re, uh, re results. Uh, you'll see you'll hear an example about how the Nazis tried to use jazz in the episode. And you see for yourself, they weren't very good. That they weren't very, very good, good at that. <clears throat> okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, some of the, uh, of course, uh, in, 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 term, in, in terms of songs which really got the people going, and uh, uh, songs like Drum Boogie and, of course, Glenn Miller's tunes like In, in, uh, in, in the Mood, which, of course, undoubtedly, uh, undoubtedly, you've heard at some point in time in, in various uh, movies. There was the. Uh, uh, there was the uh, Steven Spielberg film with John Belushi in 1941, which featured that song prominently. That film came out in the late 1970s. But again, but once you hear "In the Mood," you know you know what song I'm talking about. That song, you might say, was the epitome of uh, uh, of American jazz, American music as a means of uh, of, of, of promoting ideas such as liberty, freedom, democracy, and all of those all of those uh, values and, and ideas. <clears throat> Okay, let me see what else I should mention here about episode episode seven. Um, okay, unfortunately, and this and this and this is a really in, in, interesting interesting trait about you might say U.S. Uh, policies at the time. Even though uh, abroad uh, that is a uh, tour toward Europe, the U.S. was promoting ideas such as liberty, peace, and freedom. At, at, at home, there were some problems uh, behind the scenes, and of course, you'll get a great sense about this when we look at the uh, Zoot Suit right for the PowerPoint program. Excuse me, coming uh, com coming up pretty soon. So, in other words, the United States seemed to have this, uh, uh, for lack of a term, double-faced view of things. That is, that is, uh, that is uh, at, at, overseas. Um, <clears throat> Overseas, the U.S. promoted all these ideals and values and, and, and notions, but at home, things weren't hadn't changed much for you might say the minority populations, whether it's the African Americans or the young Mexican Americans, the young Chicanos, the Zoot Suits in places like like Los Angeles, uh, but in San Diego too, and in the Bay Area, in Phoenix, and Tucson, all of those places. So in other words, uh, in other words, the U.S. is saying, uh, okay, we're going to promote liberty and freedom for you people in uh, in, in France and, and Belgium and the Netherlands. We'll bring democracy to you, but you Mexicans, or you you stop that stuff. You African Americans, don't don't do that. Behave yourself. That type of thing. I think uh, a a lot of people really really felt felt that notion, and uh, and these ideas were def are, are definitely uh, are definitely epitomized or discussed as episode seven uh, uh, episode seven con con continues. Um, but in the meantime, despite all the trouble at home during the war, people like uh, Duke Ellington continued uh, con continue with, with, with their work. Ex, uh, engaging in, in new ways, uh, new uh, new vehicles, new vehicles of expression to to promote their music, R writing uh, scores, uh, uh, musicals, uh, uh, you, you, uh, you, you might say. <clears throat> uh, and then and then as the war is wrapping up by 1945, we meet some other art artists too, it, other artists too, in, in that 
as um, the U.S. as the U.S. war technology start to improve dramatically by the end of the war, by 1944, 1945, those changes are also being reflected in the music industry too. New styles, new techniques, new methods. Dave Brubeck of California uh, is, is among those who you might say really starts to pick up on this. So we'll meet a little bit more of those. So we, we see a little bit about Dave Brubeck toward the uh, end of end of episode seven. I will get into more of, of Dave Brubeck in, in, in some subsequent subsequent uh, uh, chapters. And and uh, and once the war ends and the uh, and, and the ban on recording uh, had had been ended with the uh, with the end of the war by the late 19, by late 1945 we see a new breed of artists come on the scene and, and really take things in a new direction with people like Dizzy Gillespie, uh, Miles Davis, Max Roach, Cur Curly Russell, um, uh, and, uh, and, and of course Char Charlie Parker and uh, and a host of others and these people that we'll get into a little bit more in episode eight. Okay, so on that note, in episode eight, episode eight is called the Risk, and uh, and and clearly. This is a good reflection of how the country has changed because once the war ends, all these new advances and, 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 and technologies, uh, of course, are brought into civilian life. And I think we're seeing a prime example of how that's happening in the U.S. today because, of course, the big thing now is, is the drone technology. Uh, there's, there's even been some reports that Amazon that come wants to use drones to, uh, uh, to, take their, to, to take the products from their uh, distribution centers to people's residences. Of course, the FBA is going to have something to say about that. But the fact that drones are around right now, it's a legacy of what the U.S. did in, in Iraq, uh, in the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Drones came on the scene in the years, in the subsequent years after, uh, after the invasion of Iraq, and of course, uh, further, uh, uh, and of course, a further involvement in Afghanistan, and uh, and of course, what happens in the late 1940s, a lot of the advances in in, uh, uh, in all kinds of. Uh, uh, all kinds of in industries, all kinds of uh, uh, techno uh, technologies, these things are starting to come to the forefront in the late 1940s, and the music picks up on this too. So the music becomes more fast-paced, more frenetic. This is the rise of bebop, and uh, and people like like Gillespie, Parker, and Davis are the ones who really come on on the scene. And the song "Salt Peanuts," you might say, really uh, uh, really shows the drastic shift from the uh, swing la di da. Uh, uh, dancing music of Artie Shaw, Glenn, Glenn Miller, uh, <clears throat> uh, Benny Goodman. So you compare what, what those guys did with uh, what Gillespie and Parker were doing with Salt Peanuts. Totally drastic shift, and uh, that shift would be this, is being discussed further in the rest of, of epi episode episode uh, eight. <clears throat> okay, so in other words, the swing era had come to an end. The jam session had become the norm, and again, this is the rise of the idea of, of bebop. And... Uh, uh, the clubs in New York, such as uh, Charlie's Tavern, uh, the uh, uh, um, the uh, uh, um, or the uh, uh, Chateau Gardens, and of course the uh, and of course uh, Birdland, which was named after which was uh, named after Charlie Parker. These, you might say, became laboratories of this new fast-paced, uh, frenetic uh, type of energy. Because before the war, you had these big giant bands. So remember, whether it was Benny Goodman, Fletcher Henderson, uh, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, Chick Whip. Big, big, giant bands. Uh, Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Lunsford. Uh, there was choreographed. There was a lot of uh, everyone. Uh, dr uh, um, everyone dressed the same. The uniforms. The uh, uh, the band leader really kept the tight uh, lid on things. But after the war, totally different. It was fast paced. It was quartets, quintets, uh, sextets. Miles Davis uh, came out of St. Louis at this time. He was just starting up his, in, in his late, late, late teens. So he latched onto a lot of these guys. And, uh, and of course, continued this into the 1950s and then through the 1960s and <clears throat> into the 19, 1970s too. We see more jazz festivals come on the scene. There's a famous a famous festival in in, 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 in Paris where uh, even some of the legends like Sidney Bechet were still around, and even Charlie Parker, one of the younger guys, uh, had had had, had, co had come on on the scene too. Um, <clears throat> Interestingly, Louis Armstrong, all this for this time, remained constant uh, since the 1920s. But because of Armstrong's personality and his style, he was being regarded as an Uncle Tom. His music was making fun of black people. It was this. It, it, it was that. So Armstrong got a lot of, I really believe, unwanted or, or uh, 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 undeserved attention uh, um, at, at this point in time. But Armstrong really straight to straight, straight that. He really stayed true to himself, is what I try to say, all, all, all this time. And I think up until his death in the early 
1970s, he continued, continued to do that. It's just that as the country, as the country was changing uh, over the years, perceptions of Armstrong's music changed change, uh, change too, even though he himself pretty much did the same thing uh, for the better part of his, uh, his 50 plus year recording, recording uh, and, and entertainment c career. Okay, uh, the other thing that's mentioned in episode 8 is, of course, the impact of narcotics, uh, drugs, uh, heroin, uh, horse, uh, dope, as it was called back in those days. And, of course, the authorities uh, in the Cold War context, you might say, were a little bit less tolerant of these types of things compared to maybe what they had been like in the pre-World War eras. Uh, because as the Cold War is starting to uh, ratchet up by the end of the 1940s, um, there's definitely a sense of what of what Professor Moss in the uh, podcast called this idea of containment culture, and um, and when you have this containment culture, anything that's seen as odd or or, or different, uh, whether it's the type of music, the type of dress, the type of uh, uh, speech you have, and of, and of course uh, whatever drugs you're taking is really really fr fr frowned upon, and uh, this and this really is the case when we get more into the into the 1950s. <clears throat> Okay, uh, I mentioned Miles Davis, so th there's a little bit more coverage of Miles Davis uh, uh, toward the end, end of episode eight, and also too we, we see uh, we see other artists, uh, other artists come come on the scene. Uh, Ella Fitzgerald is the one who really starts to put bebop in, in, into uh, in, into in, in, into words. So she basically blends the uh, scat traditions that Armstrong had done years before. She uses that and, and attaches that to the uh, uh, to the bebop sound. Uh, and in essence, makes helps make bebop a little bit more accessible to a, a wider, a wider audience. And I think mainly because Ella Fitzgerald has uh, had been known commodity for for many years in terms of uh, her singing, her style, her her, her background. Uh, because of Ella Fitzgerald singing it, you might say she made bebop more palatable to the general a masses. Those who were quite bewildered by what is this sound? It's so noise. It's bad. It's this. Even the legendary Cap Kelly was mentioned. Uh, during the series, called called the bebop Chinese music. Louis Armstrong was no big fan of it too, openly mocking it in a Hollywood Bowl per performance. Um, but it's it's all to her credit, you might say, helped to uh, open bebop more to a wider audience because because instead of denigrating it like say Calloway and uh, Armstrong had done, she put words to it, uh, and, and instead of just uh, making fun of it, denigrating, calling it the uh, this and that noise, a junk. Uh, Chinese music, you, you get the uh, 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 idea. Okay, and uh, episode eight concludes with uh, more discussion of uh, 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 of other artists. We meet Thelonious Monk, who you might say was a little bit more of an eccentric character. So he took bebop into a more wilder di 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 uh, di direction in terms of uh, his personality, his, uh, his, 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 his style. Um, but he was influenced a lot by a lot of the artists that we've met Earlier in the episodes, the 1920s, the Harlem Strike people like, uh, 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 like, uh, uh, like, 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 like Johnson, James P. Johnson, Willie the Lion Smith, and all those. So you might say Monk was the one who helped to, you might say, bring back some of the roots from the 1920s into the 1950s bebop type of sound. And then we, and then we finish off the episode with the rise of the West Coast sound because as more and more Americans, of course, are moving to the United States, I'm sorry, to California at the end of the war. Uh, they're going to the sun, the, the surf, the, the, easy, the, uh, the easy, more the uh, easy-paced lifestyle of uh, especially Southern California, San Diego, Los Angeles. The music reflects that, too, the rise of the West Coast jazz sound. The main movie of that genre would be Dave Brubeck, uh, Jerry Mulligan, Chet Baker, Chico Hamilton, and Bob Whit Whitlock. So a lot of those guys, especially Brubeck, are mentioned in, at the end of Chapter 8. Okay, uh, let me finish off with chapter nine. And this is uh, or part nine. This is the uh, the episode known as the the, the adventure. And uh, the adventure takes us into the late fifties, early sixties. And here's where a lot of the anxieties of the country begin to get more reflected in, in in the music. Because keep in mind, the Cold War had pretty much been been going on for about a decade at this point in time. And what made things worse for the U.S. was the fact that um, was the fact that uh, Khrushchev in Russia. Was causing all kinds of mischief and, and, and mayhem. The Soviets had, had uh, launched the atomic bomb in 1949, and then of course the Sputnik artificial satellite in 1957 really scared a lot, a lot, lot of, lot of Americans. And I think what contributed to this anxiety too was the fact that in 1960 John F. Kennedy was elected. So even though he promoted this idea of a new frontier, new ideas, new energies, blah blah blah, 
The fact that Kennedy was such a young guy at the time, he was only a, a <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, he was only in his in his early forties when when he when he took the White House. Uh, only uh, only forty three uh, 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 actually clearly. Uh, I'm sure this caused much consternation for many Americans who were used to seeing, you might say, these older fuddy duddies be president, whether it was uh, Eisenhower, Truman, Roosevelt, and everyone else uh, before, before then. So, uh, so of course, the music was definitely reflect, reflect that, in, reflected, in, uh, in, in, reflected in, in, in that, too. Artists like Sonny Rollins uh, really, get, get, uh, really get, gave voice <clears throat> in terms of dealing with the uh, with the anxieties of, of, of anxieties of, 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 of the country, Miles Davis especially. Uh, Miles Davis's music, you might say, was a reaction to uh, forces of suburbanization, standardization. We're hearing the term a lot, standardization, in Professor Moss's podcast. And 1950s was the you might say the era of conformity, standardization, uh, suburbs, Le 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 Levittown, all all of that, all of uh, that, that 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 stuff. Of course, this is stuff that people like. Uh, James Dean and Marlon Brando protested against in their famous movies back in the 1950s, uh, this idea of conformity. Um, now, TV shows like Believe It to Be, for you, you might say, really promote this idea of uh, uh, you know, the father go, go, goes to war, uh, the wife is there with a, with a sundress greeting the father with a pitcher of lemonade or martinis, I guess, uh, <clears throat> depending on, on the father's preference, and then, and then the boys playing in the background, riding bikes. Uh, uh, every, uh, that is, everything looked looked the same uh, 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 across the board. Miles Davis' music, in a sense, was a pro was a protest to that. He's featured prominently in the uh, in the episode. And in terms of uh, protesting against standardization, of course, the events of Little Rock in 1957. Of course, Arkansas is in the news right now for all all of the wrong reasons, along with Indiana. But back in those days, it was the Little Rock uh, Central High desegregation case. That's that's mentioned uh, mentioned too, and interestingly, the one who really comes to the forefront and you might say makes a statement, and everyone listens is Louis Armstrong. Louis Armstrong, as as I suggested, was seen as he was this, he was that, he was a fuddy duddy with an Uncle Tom. Uh, he didn't know anything about what what the young uh, African American generations were all about, blah blah blah. But when he protested loudly against the uh, situation in Little Rock and refused to go to the Soviet Union on a, a goodwill mission from the State Department. That opened up a lot of eyes, and that really showed that Louis' heart was in the right place. It's just that, unlike others who are more vocal in terms of their uh, opposition to uh, to things, uh, Armstrong bided his time, and he chose an opportune moment to express his his, his views. And I think from that point in time on, I think that changed a lot of perception about Armstrong. So even after his death in the early 1970s, I think to this day he's recognized by I recognize I'd say by many scholars as a uh, as a good uh, <clears throat> um, as a good sp spokesman for the idea of civil rights, th that is, especially someone from the entertainment in in industry. <clears throat> okay, um, let, me, let me see what else. I okay, other artists that that's mentioned too. We have our Art Blakey, Art Blakey of the Jazz mess Messengers. Art Blakey is the one who you might say helps to bring bl bring back blues to the uh, to some of the music. And Art Blakey's group uh, was a uh, you might say a. Uh, um, like a farm team or a fertile ground for other artists. So people like like Freddie Hubbard, Lee Morgan, Keith Jarrett, Wayne Shorter, Jackie McLean, and Wynton Marcellus, who's featured prominently as you might say an unofficial narrator of the of the series. They got uh, all those people got their starts in working with Art Blakey and the and the Jazz me Messengers. Okay, in the late fifties, uh, uh, we have uh, TV getting into the act and. Uh, uh, and recording a lot, lot of these early, a lot of these jazz performances, and we see an epic concert, uh, 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 an epic concert arranged on CBS in which all kinds of great musicians are are, are, are playing, among them Lester Young and, and and Billie Holiday. So the fact that, keep in mind, TV at the time didn't really know what what to put what what to put on. Um, so anything and everything could go on TV. So early TV, I guess, much much like early cable TV in the 1980s. Um, was really a lot more free form. Any, any, anything, anything goes. Uh, whether it was game shows, whether it's people on the street type of type of things. So you see a lot, a lot of jazz artists come come, come on TV. So in fact, you can go on YouTube now and, and find great clips from the 1950s of people like Art Blakey, Miles Davis, uh, 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 John Coltrane was just coming coming on on the scene back back in those days. 
and uh, and clips of people of people like uh, Billie Holiday before they pass away uh, just a few years down the road. So a lot of interesting stuff that was happening on happening on TV in the late 50s. And uh, like like I like I said, a lot of the jazz uh, was was coming on, onto the forefront at, at the time. <clears throat> okay, the episode finishes off with jazz going into more wilder directions with the rise of Ornette Coleman and the rise of free jazz. So one of the interesting uh, things that happens is that people keep complaining. Okay, uh, what is jazz? What's the meaning of it? Is it structured? Is it this? Is it that? So even among artists who maybe might have come on the scene in the 1940s, say, "No, I'm going to take these new things. It's, it's free jazz, blah blah blah, this and that." But if someone comes on the scene 10 years later and goes in another direction, that person a decade earlier might say, "What is this stuff? It's junk. It's this. It's that." You know, much like the complaints that p people like Cat Calloway and uh, Louis Armstrong might have had a few decades earlier, those same people from the 1940s are complaining about what the people in the 1950s are listening to going on into the 1960s. So interesting how that how that works out, and uh, that notion is mentioned quite a bit in the uh, <clears throat> uh, toward the end of episode nine. All right, anything else to mention here? Um, oh. Um, no, nope, that, that you pretty much cover it. So uh, I'll say a little bit more about episode 10 when I finish off with a final preview video, or actually more of a review video. That is uh, my, my final thoughts about the entire episode, what it means to uh, what it means to American history, what it means to the class, and what it means to to, to me uh, as a, a, an professor. Okay, all right. So I hope the sun. Uh, yeah, it's late afternoon here, so the uh, so the sun hits the the back the back window here. So uh, I was definitely trying to fix it so that uh, uh, so that you guys could still see me and not see too much of a, of a glare. Okay, all right, well that's it. That takes care of this. So I've got one more video for you. Uh, I'll do that in the, toward the end, end of end of April, beginning of May, in which I do a, a recap about the entire ten part episode, and I'll say a few things about episode ten. So that's it from here. That's it from the uh, French Valley uh, head headquarters. So, uh, uh, again, it's, gr uh, it's great to see everybody back from the spring vacation, and a good luck the rest of the, uh, the second half of the semester. And uh, if you guys can see me, okay, there we go. And I'll talk to you guys again very soon. The next video I'll have for you will be in a few weeks, and that'll be the recap of the entire uh, Ken Burns uh, series.